The nation's long web of interstates provided the perfect hunting ground for a depraved predator. He preyed on hitchhikers wandering the roads. He held them captive, then tortured and raped them. When that didn't satisfy his warped cravings, he killed instead. February 5, 1990. On a road in Houston, Texas, 18-year-old Nicole Tuttle desperately tried to flag down passing motorists. Someone finally stopped for the bruised and bleeding woman. The driver took her to the closest phone to call police. At the Houston police station, Nicole told officers that she'd been kidnapped and assaulted, but she'd managed to escape. Her ordeal began in California one week earlier. On January 29th, she hitched a ride from a trucker at a rest stop. He said his name was Dusty and that he was headed east through Arizona. After a few hours on the road, she fell asleep in the back compartment of his truck. It seemed that was exactly what he was waiting for. He climbed in back and overpowered her. Before she was fully awake, he chained her to the walls and gagged her with a horse bit. The trucker whipped her and pierced her with pins and fish hooks. He also raped and sodomized her. Nicole told police that she was chained inside the cab for six days. Her ordeal didn't end there. Inside his Houston apartment, the trucker allowed her to bathe, then chained her to the bed and raped her again. She watched helplessly as he approached her with a straight razor. He pressed the blade close to her scalp and began to slice off her hair. After three hours, he forced her back into the truck this time, he failed to bind her. When they stopped at a brewery, he left her alone as he walked inside to sign for his new freight. Nicole knew this might be her only chance. She ran for it, still wearing a dog leash around her neck. Houston police stopped a trucker in the area whose rig fit Nicole's description. Hey, Nick. She said he was not the man who attacked her. A background check revealed no outstanding warrants or convictions, so police released the trucker. Nicole told the officers to stop searching. She was too frightened to testify against her attacker. She just wanted to go home to California. On February 5th, the same day that Nicole escaped, another young woman was on the highway thumbing for rides just 15 miles away in Pasadena, Texas, 14-year-old Regina K. Walters was running away with her new boyfriend. Her parents were divorced, and Regina usually stayed with her father in Houston. She'd been visiting her mother for a few days when she fled and began hitchhiking. Whether she was following the lead of her new teenage boyfriend or just testing her independence, a trucker soon stopped for the pretty young girl. Regina's mother, Carolyn Walters, was a single mom who worked long hours as a department store clerk. When she came home from work, she was surprised to find her daughter was not home. Regina. Her daughter did not answer. Regina. Carolyn found no notes and saw no other signs that her daughter had been back to the house. 
She checked the answering machine, but Regina had left no messages. Carolyn called her daughter's friends and Regina's father in Houston. No one had heard from the girl. Is Regina there? The distraught mother reported her daughter as a missing person to Pasadena, Texas police. She spoke with a detective from the juvenile section, providing the officer with Regina's description. Her 14-year-old daughter was about 5 feet tall, weighed 95 pounds, and had long, curly brown hair. The detective asked Carolyn what steps she had taken so far to find her. Carolyn had posted missing persons flyers, but no one had yet responded. The worried mother hadn't heard from her daughter since they argued two nights before. At 9.30 that night, Regina told her mother she was going to visit a friend. When Carolyn objected, the girl insisted she would be right back. Against her better judgment, Carolyn relented, trusting that Regina would call if she stayed out later. Though the young teen had a history of running away, she always returned on her own. Her mother believed this time was different. Pasadena, Texas police detective Suzanne Jackson of the juvenile division was assigned the case. She understood Carolyn's concern. Several days passed and Regina would normally call her mom when she would leave home and let her mother know that she was okay and that she was just out. She would be back when she was ready to come home and she had not done that. Carolyn posted more flyers at the convenience store close to her house. She held out hope that her daughter was unharmed. Maybe she was simply staying with a friend. Along with Regina's photo and description, Carolyn offered a reward for information on her daughter's whereabouts. Five days after Regina's disappearance, Carolyn received a phone call. The caller had seen Regina talking to two young men on the evening she left her mother's house. Okay. The person only knew the man as Billy and Ricky, but she remembered that Billy had a girlfriend with the peculiar name of Urena. Carolyn immediately called police. The following day, a second caller gave Carolyn the address of an apartment where he had seen Regina at a party two days before. When police arrived, no one answered. Okay. The manager told them the apartment was rented to a man named Billy Wayne Gibbs. The next morning, the detective told her colleagues about the case. She mentioned she was looking for Gibbs in connection with Regina's disappearance. She was also looking for two others, a woman named Urena and a man named Ricky. She didn't know their last names. To her surprise, the officers did. Billy Wayne Gibbs had a girlfriend named Urena Sweet and a friend named Ricky Lee Jones. The three were wanted in connection with an auto theft. Units were dispatched to Gibbs' apartment to wait for his return. Officers patrolled the nearby road. After several hours of surveillance, they picked up 17-year-old Gibbs and his girlfriend Urena near his apartment. Police handcuffed the young couple and brought them to the station for questioning. The third suspect, Ricky Lee Jones, was still at large. The arresting officer asked Gibbs if he had seen Regina or Ricky Lee Jones. Gibbs said he had spoken to them four days ago, but not since. He told police that Ricky and Regina were in love and planned to run away to Mexico where Ricky had relatives. The detectives suspected that 18-year-old Jones had another reason for leaving town. 
If he were caught with Regina, he could be charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Regina was 14, and they obviously were boyfriend and girlfriend at the time. When they saw the flyers that the mother had left out with reward on her location, uh, they decided it would be best to leave the area so they wouldn't be caught. And that's when they decided to leave the area, hitchhike to Mexico. The detective learned that Ricky Lee Jones was already on probation for theft. Fleeing jurisdiction was a parole violation. She issued a warrant for his arrest. She also fed Regina's description into the NCIC, the National Crime Information Center, a database listing both victims and criminals nationwide. If Regina were located by any police department in the country, Pasadena, Texas police would be notified. Until then, with no known address or vehicle, it would be difficult to find the pair. 15 miles away, Houston police interviewed Jerry Walters, Regina's divorced father. He told them he had received a disturbing call on his unlisted home number on the evening of March 17th. The conversation was brief and Walters did not recognize the caller's voice. The man asked, are you Regina's father? When Walters replied yes, the man told him he knew where to find Regina. He said she was in a loft of a barn and that there had been some changes. He had cut the girl's hair. Regina's father asked if she was dead or alive. The caller hung up without answering. Detective Jackson asked Southwestern Bell to trace the call. The company told her it would take several days. Police would simply have to wait. Aside from the phone records, the trail of the missing 14-year-old and her boyfriend was stone cold. In March of 1990, Pasadena, Texas police detective Suzanne Jackson continued her search for 14-year-old Regina K. Walters. The girl hadn't been seen since early February when she left a friend's house with her 18-year-old boyfriend, Ricky Lee Jones. The detective's only lead was an anonymous phone call made to Regina's father on March 17th. The call had yet to be traced. On the same night Regina's father received his call in Houston, her mother in Pasadena, Texas also got a call. Hello? She recorded the conversation yeah. as police had advised. Yeah. An unknown man told Carolyn to meet him at 6.30 the next morning at the local convenience store. He had something to tell her about Regina and he wanted to say it in person. Without giving his name or description, he hung up. Carolyn called Detective Jackson, who told her it was risky to meet the man. When Carolyn insisted, Jackson said police would go with her for protection. From a distance, officers kept an eye on Carolyn as she waited at the convenience store for the unknown caller. She had no way of knowing if the man knew who she was and no way to identify him. Her only hope was if he would approach her. She studied everyone who came in and out and everyone who used the phone. Carolyn waited over two hours. The caller never came forward. Two days later, Pasadena, Texas police received the phone records for both calls to Regina's parents. They learned that the call to Regina's father in Houston was made from a gas station in Ennis, Texas, 200 miles northwest of where she was last seen. The call to her mother's home in Pasadena, Texas was made from a payphone only a few blocks away. At that particular time, it was obvious that we were becoming very concerned about Regina's whereabouts uh, with the phone calls and, and the uh, information that we received. We were pretty sure that there was going to be foul play involved. Two weeks later, Carolyn told Detective Jackson that the man who had called her before wanted to set up another meeting at the same convenience store. 
police traced the call to a nearby payphone. The caller had already fled. On April 23rd, police found a partial skeleton of a small female near a riverbank in Pasadena, Texas. They determined the young girl's age and weight was close to Regina's. Detective Suzanne Jackson brought Regina's dental records to the medical examiner. I went to the ME's office with my information. Uh, we did a comparison on some dental x-rays and uh, found that this particular person was not Regina. Months went by with no leads. Regina's parents feared the worst. On October 12th, two boys were playing near a dirt road in Manville, Texas, 26 miles south of Houston. Close to the road, they came across a wood pile. They found something they'd never forget. Human remains. They ran home to tell their parents, who called police. Officers arrived and secured the area. They could not identify the body at the site. It was too badly decomposed, and there was no wallet or identification nearby. All police could guess was that the victim was a child or young adult. They hoped an autopsy would tell them more. The Pasadena, Texas detective traveled to the Harris County Medical Examiner's office, bringing Regina's dental records. So you almost have a match right the ME compared those records to x-rays taken of the corpse. But then you get everything they did not match. It was a little disappointing, although we were very relieved that it was not Regina. Her parents at this particular point were concerned that um, we were going to be recovering a body and we were not going to be locating Regina alive and they were ready for some type of closure at this point. As the search continued in Texas through the fall of 1990, a farmer prepared to burn down his old barn in Bond County, Illinois. He hadn't been inside in years. The farmer climbed up into the hayloft to make one last check of the place. He looked through the abandoned building, but found only items long since discarded. Nothing seemed especially unusual or out of place. Then, something caught his eye. He looked closer at the strewn hay and saw a skeleton that appeared to be human. The farmer immediately called police. In October of 1990, as Detective Jackson hunted in Texas for 14-year-old Regina K. Walters, a decayed body was found in the hayloft of an abandoned barn in Bond County, Illinois. Agent Mike Sheely of the Illinois State Police responded to the scene. I had received a call from the local sheriff's office in Bond County, Illinois, and they had instructed me that they had found a body in a rural setting uh, near the interstate, Interstate 70 which is a major interstate that travels through Bond County. Crime scene technicians conducted a thorough search of the barn. No clothes were found on or near the body. There was no wallet or other ID. They did find a single white thread close to the bones that seemed too new to have been in the old barn for long. Police photographed the remains from various angles. They found bailing wire that matched the wire wrapped around the corpse's neck. Some hair remained on the head. Because the skull was so small, police believed the victim was probably a child. The people of nearby Greenville had not seen a murder in 10 years. The anonymity of this crime was especially disturbing. Police had no way of knowing if the victim was from the area or just dumped there by someone passing through on nearby Interstate 70. At first, they weren't even sure of the corpse's age or sex. Forensic anthropologist Mark Johnsey was called in to conduct an examination. He made several discoveries that helped Illinois State Agent Mike Sheely begin to identify the victim. Mark was able to determine that it was a, a young female between the ages of 14 to 16 approximate weight, which was 90 to 110 pounds. 
there was indication that her hair had been cut. Um, the distal ends had begun to grow again, but uh, the forensics had told us that uh, it was recent. The cause of death was determined to be strangulation. The killer had almost severed the victim's head by twisting baling wire around her neck 16 times. From the condition of the joints and vertebrae, Johnsy discerned that the girl was killed almost a year before. A forensic scientist analyzed the white fiber found close to the body. Maybe it would yield a clue to what the young girl or her murderer had been wearing. He determined the fiber was mostly cotton, but it didn't come from clothing. It likely came from a towel. Searching the National Crime Database, State Agent Mike Sheely listed the Illinois Jane Doe as a white female, 14 to 16 years of age, probably killed as early as September 1989. We were uh, alarmed to find that there was 950 matches uh, with, the, with the age group and, and the category and, and the time frame, uh, which, uh, which made the task very difficult uh, to begin the identification process. He narrowed the field to about 100 by specifying the victim's time of death closer to the spring of 1990. The investigator then sent teletypes to law enforcement agencies working those cases. The detective investigating the disappearance of Regina Walters in Pasadena, Texas, received the teletype on October 16th. She believed the body's description fit Regina's and phoned the Bond County Sheriff's Office in Illinois. The receptionist told her they had gotten so many responses that the sheriff would have to call her back. Before she hung up, the detective remembered the mysterious phone call Regina's father had received. The caller had said the girl was in a barn. When I asked her if the body was found in a barn, she immediately transferred me to the sheriff, in which I started talking to him right away. And it was immediately discovered that it was possibly Regina and so we immediately jumped on that and started sending the teletypes back and forth. The detective asked another question based on the March 17th phone call to Regina's father. Did the girl in the barn have shorn hair? The Illinois authorities confirmed that she did. The girl found in Illinois matched the caller's description of Regina. We sent a copy of dental x-rays to Greenville, Illinois, to the sheriff's office, and those dental x-rays were matched with the body that was discovered there, and it was confirmed to be Regina's body. One question remained. Where was Regina's boyfriend, Ricky Lee Jones? Detectives called on the FBI for help. Special Agent Mark Young, a behavioral expert in the Houston field office, was assigned as case agent and I tried to go in and contact every person that had any involvement with uh, Ricky or Regina. I wanted to see if there was anything that they mentioned that would have proven valuable to uh, locating Ricky. At his former high school, Pasadena, Texas detectives also continued to pursue Ricky Lee Jones. That's right, you did. I you call. Just set it, A guidance counselor said that Jones had not been enrolled in school for the past year. She had little other information about him, though she did provide his last known address. It was the home of Jones's family. His sister, Tammy, was the only one there. She said that no one in the family had seen Ricky for over a year. They had written him off as a bad kid, believing he'd end up in prison. The detective asked if they had relatives in Mexico. Tammy said her mother had some in Matamoros, just south of the Texas border. Have you seen her? Jackson showed her a photo of Regina, but Tammy didn't recognize her. Okay, that's the last time has he left. Ricky was already listed as wanted because he had violated his probation. So we felt like maybe he was afraid to come home if he did know anything about Regina's disappearance and her death. We were in fear that he may not want to call and tell us what had happened or may be involved himself. As Special Agent Mark Young poured over the details of the case, he developed a profile of Regina's killer. 
the agent determined that 18-year-old Ricky Lee Jones probably did not commit the crime. If Ricky Lee Jones had murdered Regina, he would have done it in a fit of anger, and that would have been reflected in the crime scene, and you didn't see that. It was a very controlled, purposeful crime scene. You got the impression that this is an older person, a white male, a traveler, a truck driver, traveling salesman, somebody that had a reason to be across the country. The fact that the barn was close to an interstate supported Agent Young's theory. The crime scene told the agent more about the sadistic murderer. He had stripped off Regina's clothing, killed her slowly by strangulation, and most notably, had cut Regina's long hair. Whoever did this crime was doing things beyond what was necessary to perpetrate the crime. Maybe a uh, sexual predator, sexual sadist, a person that had other offenses also. Investigators were alerted to another crime in the town of Marshall, Texas, 200 miles north of Houston. Partial skeletal remains of a young man were found, washed up on a creek bank. The skull had been perforated on the left side by a small caliber firearm. Though there was little evidence to positively identify the body, the victim's age and location led police to conclude it was probably Ricky Lee Jones. I came to the conclusion that uh, there were no other leads to cover in this case. For all intents and purposes, the case was closed in our division. We had nowhere else to go. To investigators, it looked like the man who had killed Regina K. Walters and her boyfriend had gotten away with murder. As the hunt for a sadistic killer ground to a halt in Pasadena, Texas, a thousand miles west in Arizona, authorities encountered a problem on their own highways. An Arizona highway patrolman was at the end of his shift when he came across a tractor trailer parked on the side of an interstate on-ramp. The rig had to be moved. It was a hazard to passing motorists. He noticed the lights were on and the engine was still running. As he approached the driver's door, Officer Michael Miller recalled that a man suddenly burst out of the cab and immediately spread his arms against the truck. And I asked him, I said, what's going on? And he said, nothing, officer. We're doing just fine. He said, there's no problem. Uh, I, I've got a, a gun in my back pocket. And he motioned to his back pocket and then put his hands up on the side of his truck. This was kind of unusual situation. And I could still hear the woman screaming on the inside of the truck. Miller cuffed Robert Ben Rhodes and escorted the trucker back to his car to question him further. He said it was just fine. They were uh, there together in a, uh, I guess you would call it, consenting situation. And, uh, but I didn't know if the screams coming from the woman were the fact that she was startled, she was surprised, but I was going to find out what the situation was. With Rhodes's hands cuffed behind his back, Miller seat belted him into the patrol car. The officer returned to the truck to check on the frantic woman. He found her handcuffed to the wall by her wrists and ankles. The patrolman assured her she was no longer in danger. I told her, ma'am, you're going to need to remain here until I can get some help out here because this is a criminal or a crime scene and some detectives are going to have to look at this. I said, just remain calm. This man is not going to be back to bother you again. Just remain calm. I left the truck and moved back to my patrol car. Miller returned just in time. Rhodes had maneuvered his cuffed hands in front of him and released his seatbelt. He was about to open the car door. The officer quickly recuffed him. There is no actual routine stop out there in the road that no matter what you come across out there, you never know who you're dealing with. And it kind of sent a chill up my spine to know that if this man, uh, as cool as he was, could have probably killed me and the girl at the same time and still been on the road. Police from the town of Casa Grande arrived on the scene. They freed the woman and transported her and Rhodes to the police station for further questioning. 
Inside the truck, they found a gruesome array of torture tools, chains that attached to rings welded to the back of the sleeper compartment, fish hooks, bloody towels, a horse bit, and a briefcase filled with the implements of a sexual sadist. They also found a camera in the briefcase, along with several hairs that did not belong to the woman found in the truck. Casa Grande police detective Rick Barnhart led the investigation. Robert Rhodes had a, what I refer to as a rape kit in his truck. He had all kinds of paraphernalia. He had uh, long sticks with clips on the end where he would draw and quarter his victims. He had whips. And just based on that, I, I, I knew Robert Rhodes was a, a predator. Um, just know what the the woman found chained in Rhodes's truck was 27-year-old Kathleen Vine. She told the detective she had been picked up about an hour earlier from the Rip Griffin's truck stop north of Phoenix. He was trying to rape. When she dozed off in the sleeper compartment, the trucker climbed back, assaulted her, and chained her to the walls. The man told her his name was Whips and Chains and that he'd been doing this for 15 years. Police photographed her injuries, wrist burns from the handcuffs, and welts from the beatings. She tried to fight off her attacker, but her hands were chained. All she could do to defend herself was to bite him. She managed to injure his left shoulder enough to distract him from raping her. Kathleen agreed to press assault and kidnapping charges, but Detective Barnhart believed she might be problematic for the prosecution. My interview with Kathleen was um, really sort of bizarre. She would uh, talk about this reality, this terrible assault that she endured, and then periodically she would revert back to a story about her traveling across the country to, to see the president. She told me she wanted to give the president a microchip, and she talked about the underground prison where no one escapes from. And all this time, my heart was sinking because I, I needed Kathleen to tell a, a very lucid story about this, the horrible incident that happened to her. The detective asked trucker Robert Ben Rhodes for his version of events. Rhodes said Kathleen was crazy and described her as a lot lizard, the trucker's term for a woman who trades sex for rides. He claimed that she solicited him and that she liked it rough though they never actually had sex. She's, she's never to, he refused to provide any details about what happened in the truck's sleeper compartment. What happened? I mean, she's yeah. He talked around the subject, never admitting to any crime. Can you please remove your... Police photographed Rhodes's wound. It looked like a bite mark on his left shoulder, just as Kathleen had described. Rhodes claimed he sustained the injury while loading his truck but Detective Barnhart believed Kathleen's story. She told me she tried to bite his throat, but he moved and she bit him on the left upper shoulder. And we, we've got a photo of her bite mark and her story well, completely corroborated, you know, what happened in that, in that sleeper cab. Local prosecutors arrested Robert Ben Rhodes and held him for aggravated assault, sexual assault, and unlawful imprisonment. But their only witness, Kathleen Vine, suffered from paranoid delusions. To keep him behind bars, they needed additional witnesses. Kathleen's claim that Rhodes had been kidnapping women for 15 years haunted Detective Barnhart. He entered Rhodes's name into the NCIC in case other agencies had reported similar crimes. As the detective pursued the case, it made headlines across the Southwest. A Houston police officer was among those who read about it. The trucker detained in Arizona sounded like the same man who was stopped outside of Houston earlier in the year. Police suspected Rhodes had held a woman captive in his truck for six days, raping and torturing her until she finally escaped. They were unable to press charges since the woman failed to identify him. Houston Police Sergeant Bomar described the case to Detective Barnhart. I was contacted by Sergeant Bomar. His was the case where the young lady escaped. I was 
fairly positive that Robert Rhodes was at least a serial rapist. I had suspicions that he might, he might be a murderer. Since Rhodes had crossed state lines since his last crime, Detective Barnhart contacted the FBI to request assistance. He hoped that with the FBI's support, he could gather enough evidence of the trucker's serial sex crimes to build a case that would stick. Special Agent Bob Lee of the Houston FBI field office knew the place to start was in Rhodes's Houston apartment. He spoke to Rhodes's landlord. She had checked the apartment after the trucker's arrest and was horrified to find bloodied torture devices. Based on her statement, Agent Lee secured a warrant to search the premises. We know that uh, serial rapists often keep souvenirs from their victims, uh, whether it be a piece of clothing or a piece of jewelry or whatever. When we went in, we found bondage paraphernalia, we found chains, we found handcuffs, uh, we found a rack that someone could be tied to. We found a lot of women's jewelry. Agents and Houston police also found bloody white towels, women's clothing, and stacks of photographs. The snapshots depicted some women with shorn hair in various states of undress, bound and bruised. Investigators believe that Rhodes shot the photos as souvenirs of his crimes to relive his victim's terror. Though agents now had evidence that Rhodes was likely a serial rapist, they were unable to identify any of his victims from the photos. With no additional witnesses, the case in Arizona was still weak. Prosecutors' only witness, Kathleen Vine, was questionable. A trial would be a contest of he said, she said, and a mentally disturbed woman might leave jurors unconvinced. By December 1990, the best Arizona prosecutors could do was to offer Rhodes a deal, six years, including time served and work release eligibility, if he pled guilty to the charges against Vine. His attorney accepted. In about a year, Rhodes could be out on parole, stalking new prey. By October 1991, a year after 14-year-old Regina K. Walters was found murdered in Illinois, her case remained unsolved. Special Agent Mark Young, an FBI profiler, predicted the murderer was probably a trucker or traveling salesman with prior sexual offenses. His signature behavior was to hack off his victim's hair. Agent Young spoke to area law enforcement agencies hoping they had open cases that might match the profile. One day, Bob Lee, who was, was an agent in the FBI uh, on the violent crime squad, overheard me talking on the phone to a police officer. And he said, hey, I, I had a case I had worked uh, a few months back uh, where a truck driver kidnapped a young girl and her head hair was cut just like you're saying. The victim's name was Nicole Tuttle. She had also been raped repeatedly and had escaped the day Regina Walters and Ricky Lee Jones were last seen alive on Monday, February 5th, 1990. That same day, Houston police had stopped a trucker named Robert Ben Rhodes, who fit Nicole's description of her attacker. At the time, she told the officers it was the wrong man. Special Agent Bob Lee from the FBI's Houston field office recalled that Nicole later changed her story in the hospital where she was treated for her wounds. Later that night, she told the detectives that Robert Ben Rhodes was, in fact, the individual that had kidnapped her. When asked if she wanted to press charges, she told the police officer that all she wanted to do was go home. Lee also told Agent Young that Nicole was not the trucker's only victim. Rhodes was serving time in an Arizona prison for the assault of Kathleen Vine and was eligible for work release in just three months. The agent then described the search of the trucker's residence. And he said, we found some photographs in his apartment, some of his own pictures, uh, with somebody else with short hair, uh, who it seems like she was at a barn. The chilling photos portrayed a young girl at different locations, wearing a variety of seductive outfits. At the barn, she was in a black dress, shielding herself from Rhodes's camera. 
when I saw those photos, I said, this is Regina Walters. In order to verify that, I went to uh, the family and I got several of their pictures and uh, there are facial characteristics and markings that uh, exactly uh, duplicated the pictures Rhodes took. The FBI began to build a kidnapping and murder case against Robert Ben Rhodes. They revisited the evidence from the search of Rhodes' apartment and found more photos of Regina. They also found several articles of women's clothing, including a black dress, which lab examiners confirmed was the dress Regina had worn in the photos. Illinois State Agent Mike Sheely was notified. He forwarded the evidence found in the Greenville barn to the FBI lab in Houston. Lab examiners discovered that the cotton fiber recovered in Illinois was consistent with the bloody towels found in Rhodes's Houston apartment, but the results were inconclusive since that type of towel was so common. Detective Jackson from Pasadena, Texas met with agents Sheely, Young, and Lee at the Houston FBI field office to discuss what they needed for a solid indictment against Rhodes, not only for Regina's murder, but for crimes against his other nameless victims. With Rhodes nearing his release date, okay. Illinois State Agent okay. Mike Sheely knew they were racing against the clock. He was eligible for parole and that he was actually eligible to work outside the prison almost on a release system. And so we were under pressure to, to have the indictments and, and to, uh, to get him arrested on our, our charges. You have a seat here. Agents interviewed Rhodes's former Houston employer, Mike Eggleton. The trucking firm owner was not surprised to see him. Eggleton had been questioned by authorities about Rhodes before. A few years back, local police suspected the trucker of assaulting a woman in the back of his rig, but no formal charges were ever filed. The truck Rhodes had driven had been sold, but Eggleton provided its vehicle identification number, as well as Rhodes's trucking logs and fuel receipts. While agents waited for a trace to come back on the truck's ID number, the team began to assemble a timeline of the trucker's travels. Agents found fuel receipts from a gas station in Ennis, Texas, dated March 17, 1990, the same place and date as the call made to Regina's father, Jerry Walters. Several of the local calls to Regina's mother, Carolyn, also coincided with Rhodes's time in Houston. One question about the calls remained. The killer could easily have gotten Carolyn's number from missing persons flyers posted around town. But how had he gotten Jerry Walter's unlisted home number? Agent Young found the answer in evidence stored in Arizona. It was in that evidence that we located Regina Walter's little spiral notebook. And the front cover was all of her personal information, her mother's address and phone number and her father's. When Young flipped the notebook over, he found something even more disturbing, a message that he believed was written by Rhodes himself. A knife and gun were drawn above a phrase that appeared to have blood dripping off its letters. The phrase read, Ricky's a dead man. Only a DNA test would confirm if the partial remains of the young man found in Southeast Texas was Ricky Lee Jones. Unfortunately, investigators lacked a known source of Jones's DNA to perform a comparison. And everywhere else. Since Rhodes claimed to have been abducting and torturing his victims for the past 15 years, the team submitted their timeline to VICAP, the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, an FBI database that lists thousands of solved and unsolved crimes nationwide. Despite the limited information and gaps in the timeline, Detective Jackson was not surprised when the system returned over 50 possible matches with open homicide and missing persons cases. His trips from Houston to Baltimore to LA and back in a matter of four to five days at a time could just give you an idea of how many people he has access to in remote locations that he could abuse these people and dispose of them. A week later, Agents tracked down Rhodes's truck in Houston. Two years had passed since Rhodes had driven the rig. The cab had since been steam cleaned, repainted, and used by other drivers. But evidence of his crimes somehow survived. 
Investigators recovered a single strand of head hair that was consistent with Regina's. Miraculously, they also found a small fingerprint on the vinyl upholstery in the sleeper compartment that matched her prints. That proved she had been in the truck, but it did not prove when or whether she'd been there against her will. By January of 1992, almost two years after Regina had disappeared, investigators determined the evidence was not decisive enough to prove interstate kidnapping. They dropped the federal case. With Rhodes' parole hearing just a week away, investigators convinced the Bond County prosecutor to press charges in Illinois for capital murder. They knew the evidence was circumstantial, but they pressed on. I feared that he could escape, and I also believe that due to the overcrowding in the prison systems and, and those sort of things, that uh, he could be released. On February 6th, investigators traveled to the Arizona State Prison in Florence to serve the warrant to Rhodes. Their plan was to confront Rhodes with photos of Regina, hoping to prompt a confession. An incriminating statement would bolster their case. The suspected serial killer was unfazed, even smug. We spent approximately an hour with him, um, but Rhodes uh, was, was unwilling to, to speak with us and denied uh, any involvement in the death and um, was very, uh, very firm in his denials. And at that point, uh, we knew that uh, we were going to have to prove our case. Agents believed Rhodes knew they were fishing for a confession because their evidence was weak. They suspected this arrogant man was betting he could beat the charges. Maybe he believed that they didn't care enough about his victims to earn a conviction. A lot of serial offenders, whether they're killers or, or other sexual predators, will pick victims that they consider the forgotten people. Uh, because they're, they're banking on that element that law enforcement and society doesn't really care about hitchhikers or uh, less wealthy people, less established folks. He preyed on that type of person in the hopes that, that he wouldn't get the attention that did happen. Almost two years after the death of Regina K. Walters and the kidnapping and sexual assault of at least two other women, Robert Ben Rhodes was extradited from Arizona to stand trial in Illinois. He and his attorney managed to delay the trial date for six months. On September 11th, the overconfident trucker lost his nerve. In a Bond County, Illinois courthouse, his attorney pled down the capital murder charge that carried a possible death sentence. He accepted an offer of first degree murder with a penalty of life. Rhodes was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Even as he serves his time in the maximum security prison in Chester, Illinois, investigators have not abandoned the case. They continue to gather evidence, committed to proving that Regina K. Walters was not Rhodes' only murder victim. There is one other picture of a female as yet unidentified that got into the truck with him. We're somewhat concerned whether uh, that may be another victim. Anybody that gets into the comfort zone or the truck of, of a serial killer may potentially be a, another murder victim. Investigators continue to work on identifying the unknown women from Rhodes's past in hopes of bringing the small comfort of closure to their grieving families.